Now, this is where you're all going to start focusing because this is like the head honcho. This is the secret behind it all. We have the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus was in the brain. Y'all remember that? Yes? Awesome. The pituitary gland is also known as the master endocrine gland. Master endocrine gland. And that's because the pituitary gland really controls the majority of your endocrine glands. Okay? Now, we learned in lab that the pituitary has two parts to it. There's an anterior pituitary and a posterior pituitary. So the posterior pituitary drops down from the hypothalamus, and it is actually made of nervous tissue. They even call it the neurohypothesis. So the posterior lobe is also known as the neurohypothesis. And what's interesting is that the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland does not actually produce any hormones of its own. It does secrete two hormones, but they're made in the hypothalamus and then secreted in the posterior pituitary. So you can almost think of this posterior pituitary as part of the hypothalamus, sort of like a little extension or add-on to the hypothalamus. The anterior pituitary, that is the part that actually forms around that posterior. The anterior pituitary is the one that has the job of producing seven very, very important hormones because they control most of your endocrine glands. So anterior lobe is the adenohypothesis. The word adeno itself means gland. Um, producing seven hormones, and we are going to talk about those hormones extensively. Now, in addition to uh, what's coming out of the anterior lobe and the two hormones that are released from the posterior lobe, the hypothalamus itself has the ability to secrete its own hormones. And these hormones are either going to be releasing hormones or inhibiting hormones. Remember, hypothalamus is like the big boss for the endocrine gland. It's the one that sits up there and says, okay, you know what? We had that, um, we had the glucocorticoids that were lowered in the slide before. Well, the hypothalamus is the one that says, okay, I'm going to secrete a glucocorticoid releasing hormone. And then that goes to the a pituitary gland. The pituitary gets the instructions and says, okay, we have to go tell the adrenal medulla it needs to secrete more glucocorticoids. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay, so the hypothalamus releases either an inhibiting or releasing hormone specific to whatever it is it is wanting to release or inhibit. Um, and then it tells you that those hormones, whether they're releasing or inhibiting, will go to the pituitary gland through the hypophysial portal system. And that's what you're seeing here in this picture. It is simply a uh, network of arterioles or capillaries and venules that connect the hypothalamus to the pituitary. It's not a big deal. Okay, and here's an example of how that happens. So up here on number one in purple, you have hypothalamic cells, nerve cells that secrete hormones. Those nerve cells will be releasing or secreting either a releasing hormone or an inhibiting hormone, right? And that's going to go to the pituitary. The pituitary will either release or inhibit whichever hormone was asked to be released or inhibited. So the um, anterior pituitary is going to secrete things like um, growth hormone, TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone, ACTH is adenocorticotrophic um, hormone, PRL is prolactin, FSH is follicle stimulating hormone, or LH is luteinizing hormone. So what does that mean? It means that when the, when the hypothalamus gives off a releasing hormone to the pituitary, Let's say it's giving off a uh, TSH releasing hormone to the pituitary. The pituitary releases TSH. That TSH goes to the thyroid gland and tells the thyroid gland, hey, we need, it's a thyroid stimulating hormone, right? Hey, we need T3, T4. Give us thyroid hormones. We're low. And that's how the hypothalamus in conjunction with the pituitary can control all of your endocrine system. 
crazy, right? Yeah. No. All right. And here are those hormones broken down for you. Um, in a summary, we're going to talk about the important ones on their own, so there's no question about what you need to know. And a big one right here is human growth hormone. Human growth hormone was something that um, was not widely known, except for like doctors and scientists. But recently, I've heard that people are like starting to take it, right? Human growth hormone? Yeah, bodybuilders. and um, Yeah. Well, it's called human growth hormone, okay? And it is the most abundant hormone coming from the anterior pituitary. It's huge. It's a major deal. Human growth hormone comes out in births. That bursts, ouch, sorry. But it is still controlled by the two hypothalamic hormones, whether they are inhibiting or releasing. And here's an example of how that looks. You'll have a growth hormone releasing hormone or a growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So these two hormones right here are actually coming from the hypothalamus. And they will go to the pituitary and say, hey, inhibit growth hormone release or release growth hormone, right? It tells the pituitary what to do. So if the pituitary then um, follows those instructions and releases that growth hormone, then the growth hormone is going to go to its target cells and cause what it needs to happen, things like your liver, your bone, your muscle, your cartilage. Um, sorry, my back hurts. And here it is in picture form. So from your hypothalamus, you're either getting the release, the R here, or inhibition of growth hormone goes to the pituitary. It will either secrete growth hormone, hormone or inhibit that secretion and not secrete growth hormone. And then growth hormone goes to the target cells. Okay? And that obviously is, again, a negative feedback system, meaning anytime you have hypoglycemia, um, you are going to release growth hormone because growth hormone is one of the things that helps increase blood glucose by breaking down glucose. It's going to increase um, it's going to um, increase levels of fatty acids. It's going to decrease the amino acids. If you have the opposite, if you have hyperglycemia, you have too much blood glucose and you need to lower it, then you would inhibit the release of that growth hormone so that glucose is not released into the bloodstream. All right? Does this make sense? I just want to understand the basics now before I get to know all of the actual hormones. And we are running out of time, aren't we? Okay. And this is probably the most important slide right here. In summary, what the anterior pituitary gland is going to secrete, growth hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, <clears throat> that's actually talking about the follicle, the ovarian follicle that's in the ovaries. Luteinizing hormone will also go there. Prolactin goes to the mammary gland for milk production. Adenocorticotrophic hormone is going to go to your adrenal glands, and then your melanocyte stimulating hormone to stimulate your melanocytes. So those are some very important hormones coming from the um, anterior pituitary. Okay. And there's your summary. Ooh, you guys can read the summaries on your own. Okay. The posterior pituitary does not synthesize any hormones, but it does secrete two of them. It stores them and secretes oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, ADH. Y'all remember that from the last unit, I hope. Yes? Okay. Um, and we're going to learn later on when we do the female that oxytocin is going to be the one that is going to promote milk release from the mammary gland and contractions in the uterus. And what does ADH do? Better tell me now. <laughs> yes. Okay. Good deal. So all of the, these are produced in the hypothalamus and they are stored in the posterior pituitary. And the communication between that hypothalamus and that posterior pituitary is called the hypothalamus hypothesal tract. That's the part that has those axons of the cells that are secreting those hormones in order to store it in the posterior pituitary. So oxytocin, what does it do? Right, in the uterus, it's going to enhance contractions. In the lactating mammary gland, it is going to stimulate milk ejection. ADH, this should be a review at this point because we've talked about it so much, 
Okay, what does it do? It's gonna decrease urine output by stopping things from passing. It's an antidiuretic. So it's going to increase what? Right, right. It's going to increase my blood volume and that's going to cause a decrease in ADH secretion or if I have a decrease in blood volume, that's gonna cause an increase. So if my blood volume is low or my blood pressure is low, I need more fluid in that blood to keep that pressure up. ADH is gonna stop the kidney from losing that water. It's gonna retain the water, right? And that'll increase your blood level and also increase your blood pressure. This should all be reviewed by now, I hope. We should know it. Okay, the thyroid gland. What does the thyroid gland do? Just common knowledge. It has something to do with thyroid hormones, right? Okay, we've seen it in lab. It is a butterfly-shaped gland in the front of the neck, anterior, just below that thyroid cartilage. It has two lobes, the left and right. They're connected in the center with an isthmus. Some of them will have a little pyramidal shaped lobe right there on top in the middle. So, yes, ma'am. That is, that's a synthetic oxytocin. Yes, it's a synthetic. It is, and it's meant to do exactly what oxytocin does, right? It's just a th synthetic form of oxytocin. Okay, so in the thyroid gland, what does it look like in microscopically? We have thyroid follicles made of follicular cells. And in the center of the follicle was thyroid colloid. Right, that's what your testing on this group. And then outside the follicle, we had parafollicular cells. Y'all get your head straight. Okay, so those follicular cells are stimulated by TSH to produce your thyroid hormones, which are T3 and T4. T3 is known as, or is triiodothyronine, tri3, and thyroxine is your T4. T3 and T4, those are our thyroid hormones secreted by the follicular cells. And the stimulation to secrete that or to produce that is for coming from your TSH. Where did TSH come from? The what? No, TSH goes to the thyroid and says, hey, thyroid, we need thyroid hormones. It comes from the pituitary, from the anterior pituitary. Okay, recap. The, hypo the hypothalamus secreted, you're releasing and you're inhibiting hormones. That went to the pituitary, the anterior pituitary, and then the anterior pituitary produced your FSH, your TSH. Do you remember it now? Okay. That was the step that we did last week. Okay, you got it. Okay. And then, so that's from the follicular cells, those main cells that make up that circle, that follicle. The parafollicular cells, the ones that were on the outside, what do they do? They will also have a hormone called calcitonin. And calcitonin is going to play a big role with our calcium homeostasis. Okay? What does that mean? Calcium levels in your blood, right. Okay, so TRH is thyrotropin releasing hormone that's coming from the hypothalamus. Remember, you're releasing or inhibiting, the hypothalamus is. So your thyroid releasing hormone is going to come from the hypothalamus. It goes to the, where does it go? Pituitary. The pituitary is going to secrete your thyroid stimulating hormone, your TSH. That goes to the thyroid gland. It says, hey, follicular cells, we need more thyroid hormones. So then it produce, they produce T3 and T4. Does this make sense? Okay, and that basic idea of the hypothalamus giving you either a releasing hormone or an inhibiting hormone, and that hormone going to that anterior pituitary, and then the anterior pituitary gives off the directions, whether it's stimulating the thyroid or stimulating a follicular, you know, a follicle from maturing in the ovary. It's the, it's the anterior pituitary that produces that hormone. But those initial directions come from the releasing or inhibiting from the hypothalamus. Okay, so what do thyroid hormones do? Oops, 
what are they going to do? They're going to increase our basal metabolic rate. I like to think of thyroid hormones almost like, um, sort of like an amphetamine or being excited. Everything is increased, right? You're, you're super hyped. You're burning a lot of um, fat, right? Yeah, that's what thyroid hormones do. So they're, going, they're meant to maintain, um, oops, they're going to increase your basal metabolic rate. What does that mean? All of the metabolic activity is going to be going at a faster speed. My um, body temperature should be maintained by it as long as it's normal. It's going to stimulate protein synthesis. It is going to increase the use of glucose and fatty acids to make ATP. This is that energetic, I'm excited, I'm ready to do something stage, right? Your body's prepping. Um, Upregulate beta receptors that attach to catecholamines. Catecholamines, do you remember what they do? Work with HDH and insulin to accelerate body growth. So that is everything that your thyroid hormones do. Basal, metabolic rate, body temperature, um, producing ATP and proteins, regulating your receptors that will are used for catecholamines, and then it's going to work with um, your human growth hormone and insulin to accelerate your body growth. And there's your summary for the thyroid hormone. Okay, parathyroid. So on the back, the posterior side of that thyroid gland, there were four pea-sized glands, remember those? The parathyroid glands, that's right. So parathyroid glands are in the back. They have two types of cells that we want to talk about, your chief cells and your oxyphil cells. Um, your chief cells are going to produce parathyroid hormone. Your oxyphil cells are not as well known in function, so we don't have to worry about them, but we want to focus on this parathyroid hormone because parathyroid hormone along with calcitonin is going to control our blood calcium levels, and that's an important thing. So where did calcitonin come from? Do you remember? We just talked about it. The thyroid gland. So calcitonin came from the thyroid gland. Um, parathyroid hormone is coming from the parathyroid gland. The two together are supposed to balance our calcium levels. How do they do that? We're going to talk about it in a minute. Did I not have it up here? OK, that's OK. Do you guys remember what calcitonin did? Yeah. Well, here, we can get it from right here. Calcitonin lowers your blood levels of calcium. OK. Parathyroid hormone and calcitrol are going to, or parathyroid hormone is going to decrease decrease your blood levels of calcium. I think I'm missing a slide. OK, the adrenal glands, also called the suprarenal glands. Where were they? On top of the kidneys, right. Very good. They're little pyramidal shaped glands, one on each kidney, left and right. Um, they were covered in a capsule and they had two regions, a cortex and a medulla. This should all be in our heads already by now, cortex and medulla. Remember when we looked at the slide where the cortex had zones in it? This is when we're going to take a closer look at those zones because each zone has a different cell that secretes a different hormone. So your zona glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. Remember, glomerulosa was the one closest to the capsule. Then you had fasciculata. Then you had your reticularis. And there's your capsule right here up top. OK. So the zona glomerulosa is going to secrete your mineral corticoids. Your zona fasciculata is secreting your glucocorticoids. And your reticularis 
is going to secrete your androgens and androgens are gonna be important when we talk about our sex hormones. Okay, mineral corticoids. Do we, have we ever talked about any of them? Yes, we have. And here's one you should be really familiar with, aldosterone. And you already know it comes from the adrenal gland, right? And you know what it does, because we talked about it in the last unit. Okay, so we're gonna take a minute to talk about this renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway. We've sort of already discussed it, but we just want to look over it one more time. You guys, this should be really familiar because we did it over and over and over, okay? All right, so here it is. Looking at that, does that confuse you at all? No? Okay, well, let's start with number one. So we have a patient that's dehydrated or sodium deficiency or bleeding out. We've had a lot of bleeding, hemorrhaging. That's going to cause a decrease in your blood volume. If your blood volume is decreased, your blood pressure is also going to be decreased. What happens when your blood pressure decreases and your kidneys pick up on that? You right, you have cells in the kidney, right, at your dextroglomerular cells are going to sense that decrease in pressure coming into the glomerulus. They're going to secrete renin. Okay, then you hide your angiotensin, angiotensinogen, your precursor coming from the liver. You've got your angiotensin 1. And then you have your angiotensin II. What does that do? You're going to go vasoconstrict your arterioles. That's going to increase, increase your blood pressure. At the same time, in your adrenal cortex, you're going to have aldosterone. What is that going to do? Increase your sodium and water reabsorption. What does that mean, reabsorption? I'm asking because this is one of the questions that a lot of you got incorrect on the test. What is reabsorption in the kidneys, in the glomerulus, the tubules? It's being reabsorbed, right, from the tubule to the peritubular capillary. Yes, because that was one of our problem areas. Okay. Okay, so then we're increasing reabsorption. We're taking back the sodium. Water comes along with that sodium. We've now increased the fluid that is in the capillaries, right? That is also going to increase our blood volume and increase our blood pressure. That is your renin pathway, your renin angiotensin um, pathway, okay? It really should be just a review at this point. This is not new. Do we have any questions on it? Now that I've shamed you, made you feel like you should know it. Do you have any questions on it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, glucocorticoids, glucocorticoids, <clears throat> so that was our mineral corticoid. Glucocorticoids is going to be cortisol or hydrocortisone. This is something that maybe you've heard of before. Maybe you had a bug bite and you put cortisone 10 on it. Or maybe you went to the doctor and you had an inflammation and they put you on cortisone, right? So cortisone is one of those things that is really good really good at decreasing inflammation, making everything calm down and subside. It does some other stuff. It does control protein breakdown, glucose formation, lipolysis, and helps you resist stress, inflammation, and immune responses. And these are the reasons we tend to see it um, used a lot in areas where, or conditions where you have a high level of inflammation because it can bring it down pretty quickly. Now, our body makes our own form of cortisone in order to control all of the regular stuff that happens along. You might have like a slight inflammation or something. It takes care of it itself. <coughs> and again, it's regulated by negative feedback, which we've learned by now that most of our hormones are regulated by negative feedback. What does negative feedback mean? It means that you have a change in homeostasis, initiates that response, you release your solution. So in this case, that would be releasing or secreting glucocorticoids. The glucocorticoids themselves are going to go back and inhibit their release. That is the idea of a negative feedback. And when we, when we go into the female system, the female reproductive system on Thursday, we'll talk about one of the instances of positive feedback, where when 
the series happen and something is released, that release actually stimulates more release of that hormone. That's positive feedback. Somebody had a question about positive feedback mechanism. Who's not here today? Okay. So these are glucocorticoids coming from the adrenal glands. Oh, and then we have our androgens. And our androgens, or the androgen coming off of the adrenal gland is the hydroepiandrosterone, also known as DHEA. Does that look familiar, right? Especially if you've had a child or maybe a sibling that has had formula. You see it on the label, yeah? Have you seen it anywhere else? Just recently, like in the past, maybe, what is, I say recently, it's been like 10, 15 years. <laughs> in the past 15 years, recently, they've started putting it into a lot of stuff. And we don't, nobody ever really knows you see that DHEA and you're like, oh, it's good for me because they put that in it. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about it. It's an androgen. What does it do? Well, if, it's, if we're talking about in a male or a female, it's going to be a little bit different. In males, um, in males, it's not, after puberty, it's not going to have an effect. Before puberty, it's going to aid in the growth. It's going to help build muscle. It's going to help build bone. In females, it's going to be your main source of estrogen for females after menopause. Okay? It's an androgen. This is where our sex hormones are. Estrogens and our testosterone is going to be coming from. This is like their precursor. Okay, and then we have the adrenal medulla. So those were the three zones of the cortex that we just talked about. Then we have our adrenal medulla. Do you remember? We've talked about this before. That one instance in the sympathetic system where you had a sympathetic preganglionic that didn't have a postganglionic. Instead, it relayed onto the chromaffin cells inside of the adrenal medulla. Yes, and then those chromaffin cells were the ones that secreted the norepinephrine or the epinephrine. And obviously, that's one of your fight or flight responses. Okay, here's your summary. Okay, pancreas. The pancreatic islets. Remember the pancreas? Yes? Okay. Um, no, we didn't. Okay, endocrine and exocrine gland in one. That's my pancreas. What does it mean? Exocrine. Right, that was your digestive portion that produced those pancreatic enzymes, went through a duct into the duodenum. The endocrine portion of the pancreas is the islet of Langerhans. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, um, so those pancreatic islets, let's talk about them because we've seen them, we know how to identify them, but we've never looked at the actual details. There are four types of cells in this pancreatic islet. We have alpha cells that are secreting glucagon. Beta cells are secreting insulin. And these are the two main ones that we want to fully understand. Um, your delta cells are secreting somatostatin and your F cells are secreting a pancreatic polypeptide. We wanna talk about glucagon and insulin because those are big players in maintaining that glucose blood level, okay? Um, I want you to look over here for a minute. It's gonna tell you everything about glucagon or insulin if I'm not scribbling all over it. Okay, we'll go red. Okay, so whenever your blood glucose levels drop or they're below what your, what your homeostatic level is, that is going to stimulate the alpha cells in the pancreatic islets to secrete glucagon. Glucagon is going to go to the liver and say, hey, liver, we're kind of low here on sugar. Can you break down some of that glycogen that you've been storing? And that's what the liver does. It begins to break down the glycogen and then releases that glucose into your blood. So your end result is an increase in your blood glucose. Now, if the opposite happens, let's say you just had um, five slices of cake, which I would totally do 
Like I would eat five slices of cake. There's a cake in there right now that I'm thinking about eating. I've had a slice every five minutes. I'm about to have a few more. But let's say you had way too much sugar for some reason, and all of a sudden your system is flooded. Your blood is just racing with a lot of glucose. Too much glucose is not a good thing. So, um, again, your pancreatic islets will know that you're hyper, hyperglycemic, meaning you have too much glucose. They're going to secrete insulin. What does insulin do? Basically the opposite of glucagon. Insulin is going to facilitate that uptake of glucose so that it can be stored and put away and not circulating in your bloodstream. So it's going to help glucose find its way into cells. It's going to help convert it into glycogen again so you can store it rather than have it circulating around, okay? And then end result is you will decrease that blood glucose. Does this make sense to everybody? Because this is important. You do want to understand the idea between glucagon and insulin. They're both coming from the pancreatic islets and result is balancing your blood glucose levels, okay? Then we got our summary pages. Okay, just a quick note on the ovaries and the testes. We will take them in detail when we do the male and female. Um, the ovaries are going to produce estrogen, and they will actually produce it in two different forms, estradiol or estrone. They'll also produce progesterone, relaxin, and inhibin. Um, the testes are producing testosterone. Okay, and those are our hormones coming from the ovaries and the testes. Questions on those? No? We will do them again when we do the male and the female uh, reproductive. Okay, the pineal gland, where's that? Up in the brain somewhere? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. Do you remember what it secretes? It secretes melatonin right and yes we all think about melatonin as a pill that you want to take at night to help you go to sleep but melatonin is actually secreted at different times of the day in order to maintain your biological clock right now <laughs> it should not be it should not be secreted right now <laughs> okay the thymus gland notice we're going into the parts the things that are not necessarily an endocrine gland but do have some endocrine function. They produce some type of hormone. Do you guys remember the thymus gland from AMP1? What does it do? T for thymus. Absolutely, T cell maturation. Remember, the T cells, the B cells came from the bone marrow. They all originate there. The T cells went over to the thymus gland and that's where they stayed to mature. So T was for, thymus was for T, T cells. So the thymus gland is in the mediastinum, that's the center of your chest, just above, just above the heart. And it does also produce um, some hormones. It produces thymosin, thymic humoral factor, thymic factor, and thymopoietin. And most of those, or all of those, will have to do with that maturation of those T cells. Those are all hormones that help support the T cells in maturing. Okay, and that's what the thymus gland does. There's your summary. Okay, quick note on the um, eicosanoids. Do you remember when we did, when we talked about hormones, about how they're circulating hormones? Yeah, they're really loud. Remember when we talked about hormones? Most of our hormones are circulating hormones, right? Like they're produced by a cell, they diffuse out of that cell into the interstitial fluids and then they diffuse into the bloodstream and then they circulate the body and find the target cell. And then there's a receptor on the target cell, they attach to it and that's how they get their job done, right? There was an instance where we said there could be a locally acting hormone where instead of circulating through the bloodstream and going to another cell, this hormone is produced by a cell and then it just goes right next door to the cell next to it. Yes, that was a locally acting hormone. And this is the, that example of a locally acting hormone. And that's really all we need to talk about on that one. Okay. 
I'm going to stop here for a minute because I think this is super important because this will aid you in your lives for the rest of your lives. I think it's an important topic, and it's the stress response. Um, when I'm talking about stress, I'm not talking about the stress. Well, I am, but I'm not just talking about the stress that you're going through now where, you know, your last week of classes, you're studying for finals, you're stressed out, right? I'm sure everyone's stressed out somewhat. Maybe some more than others. Okay, that is a stress. That is a stress. There are other types of stress, too. There are physical stresses. So that um, stress that we're talking about where, you know, I'm psychologically stressed, that is one of the ways you can be stressed. The mental stress, you can be physically stressed. Your body can be stressed um, by things like illness or exposure to um, a virus or a bacteria. Anything that alters your homeostatic state is a stress, okay? Having a huge meal, if you went to Golden Corral right now and ate for two hours, that is stress. That's stress in your body. And this is really important, so I wanna talk about how our body deals with stress. Okay, so there is something called eustress, and that is the normal everyday stress, whether it's uh, physical or psychological. That's just, you know, I'm getting ready to go out, so I'm excited. That's a stress. Um, I just ate. That's a stress because you've changed your homeostatic levels. So any little change, these are all stressors. But you stress is the type of stress that can be beneficial to us. You're about to go take a test. You're a little stressed. You actually wake up a little bit more, right? Blood flow increases to your brain. Your focus may increase because you're a little stressed. Then there's distress. And distress is the kind of stress that can be bad for us. That's when it can be harmful, okay? That's the kind of stress that your body can't overcome or maybe last too long. So let's talk about the stress response. This is what our body goes through when it is stressed. Your first part of that stress response is that fight or flight response coming from that sympathetic nervous system right? Remember what that does? Does things like increase blood flow to your muscles, right? Increase your heart rate. Yeah, it gets everything hyped up and ready for something to happen. Um, if that is a prolonged stress that you're under, then you would go into a resistance reaction, and that's your second stage. That's where you have a prolonged um, duration of stress. Um, your final stage, like the final, final stage, if that stress stays longer or lasts longer or is stronger than what your body can overcome, you go into a stage of exhaustion, and that is the final stage, okay? And I want to talk about this not because, you know, I want to talk about it because it's something that affects you in your life day to day. And I don't think we all realize how important um, taking care of stress is for your well-being, whether it's physical or mental stress. Um, you know, just like if you were really sick or ill with a cold, you would want to take medicine, you want to take care of it. Well, if you're really not well mentally, if you're stressed or upset or angry, all of those emotions do have an effect on our physical well-being. There is actually um, a manifestation that happens from our mental health. There's something called psychosomatic disorder where a person can be so unwell mentally that it physically manifests with different symptoms. It's for real, it does happen. So the idea is that I just want to stress for you guys to take care of yourselves, not only physically. I mean, it's great if, you know, if you're taking care of your body, you're working out, you're eating well, that's great. But you also have to take care of your mental well-being because the two go hand in hand. Okay? It does you no good if you're working out and, and eating perfectly, but you are not mentally well or you can't deal with the stress that you're under. You, your body will suffer physically. That was my PSA for the day. You're welcome. Just saying. Take care of yourselves. It's important.
Okay, and then a quick look here at that stress response, at what really happens on the inside when we're feeling stressed, right? Or our body is stressed in some way. Um, hypothalamus, big boss. Big boss is going to sense that stress. Notice big boss is in your brain, right? You've got your releasing hormones coming from the hypothalamus. What is it going to do? TSH, growth hormone, and ACTH coming from the uh, pituitary. Is she teasing you? Is she teasing you? Oh. <laughs> ACTH is your... What? Do you remember what it was? ACTH? Adenocorticotrophic hormone. Okay. Goes to the adrenal cortex. You get cortisol. Hopefully takes care of some of that um, stress or alleviates some of the stress on your body physically. Growth hormone coming from that uh, anterior pituitary goes to the liver, also going to stimulate lipolysis and glyco, glycogenolysis. TSH goes to your thyroid, stimulating your thyroid hormones, increasing that glucose and that ATP. So everything is designed to help reverse that stress response. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to talk about aging in the endocrine system. Y'all can tell me what happens when you age. <laughs> Just say it. What happens when you age? Everything goes down. Yes, everything goes down when you age. I know. So um, when it comes to hormones, though, they're a little bit different. They're going to fluctuate. Some things will be increased. Some things will be decreased. What always stays the same are epinephrine norepinephrine, they're not going to change levels because those are, remember, neurotransmitters that we actually need. Um, other than that, most of your endocrine glands are going to decrease in size. They're going to be replaced with a fibrous connective tissue. And that's about it. It all goes down. Okay, this is the cool part. I want to look at some of the diseases because I want to show you the pictures because I think it's super interesting. So let's talk about them. Pituitary giantism. Okay, so we're talking about something in the pituitary gland. Okay, so there are times where a person can have a lesion or a tumor or something in the pituitary gland that causes it to secrete excess growth hormone. Now, if that happens before puberty, you end up with giantism because if you're stimulating those bones and muscles to grow before those plates have closed up, you're going to end up with a really tall, huge person. That's this guy right here. That is giantism. What if you get a tumor or a patient has a tumor in the pituitary after puberty or after they've finished growing? So you have a fully grown adult that now has excess growth hormone. Right, acromegaly, absolutely. And this is what acromegaly looks like. So he's not growing in height, but those bones can still increase in bulk. Y'all keep this in mind because I've heard that people are using growth hormone now for um, muscle building and no, don't be taking any of that stuff, please. No steroids, no growth hormone, none of it. Don't need it. Yeah, but that's what happens. You end up with almost like your bones are too big for your body now because they'll thicken up, especially bones in the face and the jaw. Okay, um, the thyroid gland. If the thyroid gland is not secreting enough thyroid hormones, it can swell up because it's trying to compensate. It's trying to grow in size to increase the amount of hormones. When it does that, it is called a goiter. And this is what a goiter looks like. So right here, this is actually someone who has hypo, hypothyroidism, meaning they do not have enough thyroid hormones coming from this thyroid gland, but it is enlarged. Sorry? Um, no. Hashimoto's is actually autoimmune. Thank you, Erica, my assistant. <laughs> but yeah, so this is, this is hypothyroidism. And somebody needs to say, well, my doctor told me I have hypothyroidism and I don't have goiter. Yes, that's right. You don't have to have a goiter if, you're hypothy if you have hypothyroidism. 
This is one of those end stage things. This happens with untreated hypothyroidism. The, the thyroid is still trying to compensate. It's still trying to grow in hopes that if it grows bigger, it can produce more of that thyroid hormone. And then you have the opposite. If you have, so that was goiter right here and I don't have it. Oh yeah, if you do have um, thyroid hormones, but they're in excess, your thyroid is producing way too many hormones. It's just flooding your system with that. You, will, you can, at the end, end up with something called Graves' disease. So um, here is a picture of Graves' disease. And this is actually showing you exophthalmos, where the eyes, the fat behind the eyeball, begins to proliferate. And that actually physically pushes those eyes out forward. Um, and that is what you look like. You think about it, we probably all know somebody that that has hyperthyroidism and has ended up with exophthalmos. So that is exophthalmos. And then the end stage of that um, hyperthyroidism uncontrolled is Graves' disease. So this would be hyperthyroidism. You have too many thyroid hormones. Make sense? OK. Because a lot of people get confused over this and think, well, goiter is an enlarged thyroid. Why wouldn't that be producing more? Right? But it's actually not. It's not producing enough, and that's why it's growing. Um, I would not go to that extent. <laughs> no. Yes, sir. Sorry, I can't hear you. A thyroid, it's when you get a flood of those thyroid hormones coming in all at once. So everything your thyroid hormone does is going to be like at one time, all of a sudden you've got this racing heartbeat. You have this um, super increase, like metabolism shoots up immediately for a short period of time. But it's like, it's almost like coming in and the thyroid just dumping a bunch of T3 and T4 into your system all at once. So everything they were normally meant to do happens really accelerated all at one time. Does that make sense? So why would, so why would hypo, hyperthyroidism, why do you get, why do you have to take So T3 and T4 are meant to regulate your body temperature. Okay. If you do not have enough, you are hypo, thyroid, not enough T3 and T4, you're going to have that sensation of being cold all the time. If you have hyperthyroidism, you have too much T3, T4, you're going to be the opposite. You're going to be hot all the time, okay? Because not just, not only is T3 and T4 regulating your body temperature, they're also regulating your metabolism. So think about this. If they're increased, you're also your metabolism has increased and all of those little reactions happening in your body do produce heat. That also makes you high, gives you that sensation of being too high. So hyperthyroidism or, or most patients with hyperthyroidism are the ones that are irritable and hot. Hypothyroidism are the ones that, you know, metabolism is really slow. They're really cold most of the time. Make sense? Okay. Okay, and then we have Cushing syndrome, and that is going to be an excess glucocorticoids. And really, it gives you the picture of somebody that's been um, on cortisone for too long. So glucocorticoids have the ability to make you retain fluids. So you have someone that has um, a lot of fluid retention. They call it a moon face, where you see that there's a lot of... Um, this, I'm talking about this picture right here. There's a lot of swelling in the soft tissues. The face almost rounds out because there's so much fluid retention and it happens all over the body. Just blow up. Any questions on the disorders? No? Okay. All right. And then I'll let you look at that one on your own. You're focused on homeostasis.